everybody, this is just a quick reminder that small groups are starting back the first week in February, and uh, you can find a listing of our small groups in the church newsletter. So be sure to subscribe to the church newsletter. Look for the listings for the small groups that are going to be starting the first week in February. And we want everyone to get involved in one if you can. And we're also hoping to start some new small groups or life groups. But uh, please check that out. And I hope that you guys are having a great weekend and looking forward to a good Sunday morning. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Harold, for getting us kicked off on the right foot there. So good to see all of y'all here this morning. Welcome to Grace Works Church. We are glad that you are here with us this morning. If you're visiting with us, you are our special guest uh, this morning, and uh, thank you for being with us. We know there could be a lot of places you could be besides here, so we uh, thank you for joining us this morning. At the end of the service, um, when you exit out there, there are some visitor's cards that you can fill out, and uh, just so we can have a record of your visit for who was here with us, and uh, uh, you know, uh, hey, Lydia, come on up here on the stage here because I want you to, uh, I know that Lydia sings here every Sunday, but not, we have an in-person audience here, but we have an online audience. And one of those online audience members is Lydia's son. With uh, So would you show a picture up there? Okay, so every uh, every Sunday morning he's watching online, and hopefully he's watching right now. And if Mama does not wave at the camera at him, he gets all over her case. So if you ever see her waving at the camera on Sunday morning, that's who she's waving at. Uh, that's Dylan. And uh, so uh, Dylan is watching online right now. And w as a matter of fact, we were rehearsing yesterday, and uh, Dylan uh, was here. And uh, would you put that next picture up? Dylan was here, and he had his horse mask on. So uh, what is the name of his horse? Biscuit. He had Biscuit with him yesterday, and he was just tearing around the whole church while she and I were singing, doing laps. Did he get a nap later on after that? I hope he didn't. Holy cow, he took probably 100 laps in here. But anyway, I wanted him to pose for that picture, but I couldn't get him to pose, and so I had to make a deal with him. So the next picture was the thing that got him to pose for me for that picture. So, uh, so uh, anyway, we made a deal, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I posed. But anyway, I want to say welcome to our online audience who is watching this morning. One of those being Dylan. You can go ahead and give him a wave right now if you want. Uh, so uh, Dylan's watching, and I know many others are watching. If you have your phone on you right now, hit the share button right now because there are other people who watch this later on. And uh, welcome to our online audience. But right now, 
is our time that we're going to greet. So if you go ahead and stand up right now, we're kind of still doing our touchless greeting thing for, uh, if, and you guys can wave at, uh, at one another and just uh, say good morning. And while you're doing that, we're going to get started. Wayne's going to lead us in some songs here, starting out with He is Exalted. a seat here this morning. Thank you, Wayne, for leading us. And uh, a song that we have sung here many times, we've sung parts of this song, we sung the chorus, we sung the verse, uh, some things here and there. 
but a song that I know that many of you guys know. And we want you to sing it this morning. We're going to sing through the whole thing, talking about our Lord and Savior, our God, a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. He's our light in the darkness. We're going to sing that to him this morning. for singing with us this morning. And this morning as we come to this time, I know whenever, uh, I've, I've been in ser- the service, in church services my whole life. Ever since I was a little bitty baby, my dad was a, a, a pastor, a music pastor, been at the same church now for 47 years, been in ministry over 50 years. So 
I've gone through the motions, the routines of going to church a lot of times, and a lot of times that's just what it can be. It can be a routine. It can turn into a rut. But in a lot of times going through that, you know, you have to do things to freshen it up every now and then so it doesn't turn into a rut. But one of the things sometimes that would happen is you'd go to here and you'd go to this point in the service and then that person would get up and sing and this person would get up in prayer and then the pastor would come up and speak. And we got away a lot of times from just talking to the Lord and having a moment to talk to the Lord. And that's what we put this spot in the service for. It's just a time as we've sung songs and I pray that the Lord has been pleased with our music this morning. But this is a time for you to just take a moment yourself where you are, make an altar where you are and talk to the Lord. It's just a time of prayer. So if you would take a moment just to bow your heads and close your eyes and specifically thank the Lord for something this morning. This is an opportunity just for you to talk with him. And we'll sing another song in here in just a moment, but don't miss this opportunity right now. our sacrifice. You're my sacrifice, the greatest prize. Still more awesome than I know. You're my coming King. You are everything. Still more awesome than I know.
is more than enough. Say it with me. Lord, all I have in you is more than enough to him. Lord, all I have in you is more than enough. God, I thank you that we can come here this morning that we can sing these songs of praise to you, and Lord, that you have given us this gift of music. And so if you've given us this gift of music, we are returning it back to you this morning. God, I pray that you've accepted our praises, these songs that we sung about you, these songs that we sung for you, these songs that we have sung to you. It is my privilege this morning, once again, to speak on behalf of every person in this room right now, God, when I tell you that we love you, we thank you for the gift of salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. Now be with Pastor Bill as he brings the message this morning. Speak through him. And it is in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. How many of you came expecting to see Moses or hear a sermon about Moses today? If you've been following the, uh, the pattern, yes, today would be Moses' day. I fixed my hair to look like that, so I, you know... Had a, had a staff to carry and everything, but I am so young as I remind myself. So I decided I'd be Joshua. Yes, I'm Joshua today, uh, about uh, Michael's age. Hey, Michael, I want to ask you a question. And uh, I don't know if we could get that slide back up on the screen or not of the little horse and Michael. The, the horse and, oh. Yeah. Yes. How did you get both ends of the horse on such a small picture? <laughs> now, that was a good one. That was a good one. That was good. I, yep. <laughs> you should give him a hand for that one. That was really good. So, yes, that was. <laughs> the hand or a finger. Like, oh, my goodness. Uh, hey, I, I love our, our staff, Michael and Tony. And uh, Tony was scheduled to preach today. Uh, he and Lan are out of town. They have a death in their family. So they're in Memphis. And... Uh, so just remember them, because you know sometimes as ministers we try to be there for everybody, but then when uh, something happens in our lives, we just sort of you know try to bear it alone. And Tony's done a pretty good job of keeping everything quiet this week and not saying anything. But I told him I said, well, hey, I'm going I'm going to share Sunday morning and uh, let folks know to to keep you in in prayer. Um, I'm ready for spring. You know, I was sitting uh, in the car yesterday finishing up a sandwich and uh, before I went into the grocery store, and I, I heard something hitting my car, and it was sleet. And I thought, ah, oh, come on. You know, January is about gone. Let's, I'm, I am ready for spring to come. No more frozen pipes and all that kind of stuff. Do you remember about... I think about 10 years ago, what they called or what got named the Arab Spring. Do you remember that? People in the Muslim world had reached the end as far as they could go. They were tired of living under oppressive governments, living in poverty. So they decided they were going to do something about it. And in Muslim countries all over the world, there were uprisings. That was 10 years ago. But nothing changed. So there are places in the world now where you can't drive a vehicle if you're a woman. Middle Eastern people live in a 20% poverty level below. United States, we have 10% in poverty, but the Mideast has 20%, one out of every five people doesn't have food to eat, clothing to wear, See, in spite of the armed rebellion, in spite of the protests against the government, 
nothing changed. And if nothing changes, hope dies. One of my greatest fears right now is that nothing is going to change in America. We have been taken to the lowest point that we could ever reach as a nation. And if God doesn't get our attention, if he doesn't have our attention, then my hope begins to wane. I think we as a country are being tested. And I believe that this is a uh, battle that's being raged on every side of our nation. Everything that is a possible difference, Satan is using it to crush us, to divide us, to destroy us. There is a spiritual battle going on. Even ecclesiastical about churches. There, there is an emotional battle. The depression rate is out of the top. Try to get a counselor right now to talk to you about your feelings. It's almost next to impossible. Political divide. It's horrible. I don't care what party you like. It is absolutely disgusting that all we talk about are those things that divide us. In fact, I had someone to tell me this week. He said to me, if you preach on politics, I'll get up and walk out of your church. I didn't say a thing. I cannot but preach on politics and religion and social standards and the church because they're all one and the same. I, I can't be a lamb in the pulpit and go out into the world and be a devil. Neither can you. You are one person and you have so many issues to deal with. So every sermon has to be political, every sermon has to be spiritual, and every sermon has to be biblical. I understand what Joshua was going through. I mean, Moses had been such a uh, dominant figure in the life of Israel. For 40 years, they followed him. And then he disappeared. What was going to happen to them now? Who knew the plans? Actually, there was nobody to step in and take up the baton and finish the race. Except this young kid named Joshua. Joshua had spent 38 years wandering with the Israelites in the wilderness. 38 years in the prime of his life, lost, thirsty, hungry, chased from country to country, hated by people, confused about what God was doing. Three million Israelites set out to go to the promised land, and most of them died in the wilderness. Now, I want you to see your dream fulfilled. I want you to be the person and experience the joys that God has already written in. People are always asking me, do you think God uh, has, he knows what we're going to do and everything? And I, I say, yeah, I do, I do. I, 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 that's a different sermon, but I think that a lot of times God has to use an eraser because Pat or Boone or David 
or Bill, we decide we're going to do something else. And God says, <clears throat> okay, I'm not, I'm not going to kick you out, but now we got we got to come up with a second plan. God is constantly working with us as individuals and as a nation and as a church. God wanted the Israelites to get to this land that was flowing with milk and honey. But these people got impatient, critical of one another, and disconnected from God. They lost sight of where they were going. And so they just wandered. And one day, they were, it could have been back to where they started. They looked up and there was this river. It was the Jordan. And they were there at the time of the year where the water is the highest, the most volume, highest volume of water flowing through the Jordan. And there were no bridges, no boats. There was no place to go. Maybe that's where you are. Right now you're, you're at a Jordan. And you remember what happened back at the Red Sea. You, rem you watched the faces of those Egyptians who were drowned. You heard their screams. And God said, this is, this is the moment. Your faith is about to be revealed. Joshua said, we are on the verge of of receiving God's promise. Let's follow the instructions word for word. Here we go. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet, as soon as the priest who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped, stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarethan, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, that is the Dead Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. Remember where they are, Jericho. The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Most people who left Egypt never made it to the Jordan River. They died in the wilderness, complaining, conniving, criticizing. How did Joshua make it? And how did Joshua lead Israel to make it? You see, there was success in the fact that Joshua got through the wilderness. And you know the story. There is success in that Joshua led the people across the Jordan. But you also know the story that it's not over. They're going right into the shadow of Jericho, a fortified city that hates them. So when they think it's almost about to get daylight, a new cloud comes. And folks, until the Lord comes again, that's life. That's life. And if we as Americans or you as a Christian, if we are asking God to give us an easy life in the promised land, not going to happen. We are going to face more and more challenges, more and more clouds are gathering. 
but you can walk across through God's plan of salvation. As a saved Christian, you will find that you still face some issues and difficulties and challenges, but you will make it to the other side. So I want to encourage you. If our country doesn't make it, if our world doesn't make it, you can. Now, I share a couple of things from Joshua's life that may be of help to you. The first one is motivation. The motivating factors in Joshua's life. The thing that most contributed to his success was memory. Joshua never forgot what he experienced. Those 38 years of wandering in the wilderness, that previous life over in Egypt as a slave, he could look at the calloused hands. He could look at the scars. He could see the lost wealth that they had taken when they left Egypt. And Joshua remembered it all. But for the grace of God, we'd still be there. Now, we need to remember. We need to remember the story told us by our grandparents and parents about the Depression. We need to remember our great, great grandparents' stories about the Civil War and the other wars that were to follow. We need to remember what our ancestors experienced. For hundreds of years, we have been stripped of our dignity, imprisoned. Our property has been stolen. We've been excommunicated from the church. We have been hunted down by dogs. We have been burned and stoned and crucified. That's what happens to Christians in a world that is dominated by self, Satan. But before we kick the church to the street, we need to imagine what our nation would be without the church and Christianity. As broken and ineffective as we might be or be perceived, we are still the only thing our nation has going. So let's remember our past so that we can anticipate what lies before us. The second motivating factor in Joshua's life was that he had a great mentor. I really think that we all need to be a mentor to someone, and we need to have a mentor. How do, how do you keep tomorrow from being a repeat of today? And do you want to go through the same thing for the next hundred years that you've been through for the last hundred years, America? Do you want to have the same problems in your personal life or in your marriage or in your home? Well, we can't always work our way through those things. This is why we need a mentor who is an experienced and trusted advisor. That's my role right now at Grace Works. I am a mentor to Tony and Michael. I am there to give them the benefit of my mistakes, my problems, and my failures. I'm there to suggest some things that I think would be helpful. If I were to be speaking in Congress today, I would say to them, accept the responsibility for what's wrong in America because you have the power to change it. And if one rose in protest and said, no, we don't, I would say yes. If only one of you had reached across the aisle and took the hand of your brother or sister in Congress and said, let's pray.
we would be a different country today. I don't think politics is going to make a difference in the world, but I do think that Christ can make a difference. And when we rely on Christ, so the next time that someone comes to you with a difference of opinion, the next time someone comes to you with a juicy piece of gossip, next time co someone comes to, to question your faithfulness or to complain about you, what I want you to do is just bow your head and say, brother or sister, hey, let's pray first. I guarantee you the outcome will be 100% different because you've turned it over to God. So those are two big factors. We need mentors and we need to help other people and we need to remember. And the second thing in Joshua's life is the mission factor. Joshua had something to accomplish. He wanted to do what Abraham had begun. And then there was an obvious break someone had to step up and no one wanted to do it ever been in a situation where there was something that needed to be done but you didn't want to be the one to have to do it that's joshua but joshua said i will own the mission i will make god's mission my mission and to do that means that you have to uh, not focus on your fears, not focus on what other people are doing, how other people are voting. You focus on the mission. A lot of the Israelites, they were looking back at the, uh, the Red Sea, and they remembered what God allowed to happen to the Egyptians. And here Joshua was saying to them, okay, all we have to do is cross this river. Do what? And you know why they were afraid? Because they had spent 38 years griping and complaining and rebelling against God. I think America has a right to be afraid because we have not lived up to our motto, our claim of being a godly nation. And it has to start right here in the pulpit. It has to start right there in the pew. We have to believe that God wants us to reach the world. So owning the mission is, is what it's all about. And you lay aside the fears, you, you, you lay aside the, the world's definition of success, and you say, I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Maybe you're having trouble being a good husband or a good wife. Maybe you, you can't manage your workload on the job. Maybe you're more concerned about uh, succeeding than, than doing the job. You might even get COVID. You just do what God wants you to do. And you will never experience failure. Some people will complain. Some people will negatively compare you to the accomplishments of others. But you can take it to the bank. When you come to the water and you know that God says, I want you to cross the river, don't be afraid to stick your foot in the water. Now, I don't recommend you jumping off the high dive into the river because uh, you might be wrong. You, you know, but when you put your foot in the water and you look around and say, okay, God, is this really what you want me to do? That creek dries up, you go right on. God's leading you. He's guiding you. Second thing you need to do is you need to overcome the obstacles. Now, you are going to face obstacles in your life. I had obstacles to face when I moved down to Marlowe, when I went to college, when I went to seminary, uh, when I came to Grace Works. Those of you who are long-term members of Grace Works, you know that it wasn't easy for me to change my denominational coat. There were all kinds of obstacles. And coming to the Jordan River, this was a key moment for Israel. And they were to stand there and wait for God's signal for them to cross. And they watched a preacher. And he put his foot into the water. And the river parted. Now we Christians are 
the water testers for America. We put our foot into the ring and we watch for God's response. But unless we as Christians take that step of faith, nothing will happen. Unless we as Christians follow God all the way across, our nation will not receive their blessings. God is going to take care of the obstacles. So check them off as overcame. I overcame. Third, you need to consecrate yourself. We spent a lot of time waiting for 2020 to be over. And now it's 2021, and I haven't seen a bit of difference. I can't see the difference between my father's daughter and my sister. You get that? She's the same person. A flip of the calendar does not change world. Now, <clears throat> what I'm saying is, let's not focus on the past and compare this year to the problems of last year. Let's focus on the path ahead. As a church, as a nation, let's focus on what we want to experience. In the earlier service, I was talking with one guy and kidding him because he walks in my neighborhood. And I said uh, the other day, you know, I said, hey, man, it's not working. And then I walked up to him today and I said, you know what? I put on five pounds of those 28 pounds that I lost. I said, I got five of them back. That's how easy it is for us to slip back. But God is calling us to follow him. And now more than ever, I want to be God's instrument. Instrument of peace in the church. Instrument of peace in the nation. Instrument of peace in the home. I hope that you will join St. Francis and me. And make a commitment. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. Now, you say, preach, I can't memorize all that. Okay, look at the last word of the sentences. Peace, love, pardon, faith, hope, light, joy. And they come in spiritual order. Heavenly Father, now is our time not to be in the spotlight, but Lord, to turn the spotlight on you. Forgive us for being whiny people and a whiny nation. Segmenting ourselves over issues that won't matter when we get to heaven. And if they don't matter when we get to heaven, God, help us to remember they really don't matter here on earth. Lord, let us be your focused people, bringing peace to this world, to our neighborhoods, you bring the real eternal spring to all of us. 
God, today is the day that we cross the stream. Perhaps someone here wants to take that step. Perhaps someone watching us on their computer or phone wants to take that step. Lord, may your spirit speak and lead as we respond in faith. Amen. Would you stand as we sing together? You know, normally we don't close out with a full song, but uh, this song we wanted to sing from beginning to end. Will y'all sing it with us? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved us. grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear and the hour that I first believed help me now my chains are gone As long as this life endures and my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. Then like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love. Amazing grace, oh, my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior, he's ransomed me, and then like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, this amazing Shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine. But God, who brought me here below, you will be forever mine. Say that again. He will be. don't remember the sermon from today, remember this one statement. If it won't matter in heaven, it shouldn't matter here on earth. Tomorrow begins a new month. Let's make it the beginning of a new year. Let's get upset over things that will matter in heaven. Let's own the mission. Let's love. Because we're going to be with those people for all 
eternity. So in the month that is about love, give it your best. Well, thank you all for being here this morning. And, uh, you know, real quick, you know, uh, one thing I mentioned at the beginning of the first service, and I didn't mention it till the end of this service, and uh, the person who controls all the lights, controls all the cameras, controls the sound, controls everything in here, and she's a trustee, so she has a lot of control. It's her birthday today. Jackie Whitlock back here on the soundboard and uh, everything else. And... Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, she's very special to me. I don't recognize everybody's birthday on a Sunday, but, you know, Jackie, um, she's very special to me and special to all of us, of course. And, uh, and I didn't do this in the first service because I thought she might hit the mute button, but I'm going to do it this time. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. be paying for that next week. We'll see what happens. Hey, thank you all for being here this morning. Um, if you There's an offering box back here in the back. You brought your offering this morning. Uh, if you're a visitor, visitor's card out there. But thank you all for being here. Small groups start. I think there's one starting tomorrow night, Keith Griffith's class. So remember that. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.